father before I had five children. I had an idea about how to raise children. <laughs> and then over the course of time, they taught me that I was completely wrong. They had different ideas about how I should raise them. And of course, I conceded because I have no backbone. But the truth was the first child came along and I had these ideas about the type of parent I was going to be, which completely changed with the first diaper change. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. I had seen it on television. I had watched my older brother do it and I was fully confident that I knew how to change a diaper. And then faced with the daunting task of actually having to do it, you realize it's not so simple. I know today, in our day and age, it's much easier than it was back in the day when my parents were changing diapers because they used cloth diapers and we used disposable. Please don't anybody get angry at me for the landfills that are filled with diapers that are, non -dis that are disposable but non biodegradable. I apologize. But it's pretty simple. You lay down the diaper, you fold it over, and then you simply put the tape down. That's it. It's pretty simple. And so I went to do it the first time and my wife came in and said that I was doing it completely wrong. To which I said, how could I be doing it wrong? I'm doing it my own way. She talked about wiping from this direction and that direction and blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. And she completely destroyed my self-confidence in my ability to do this simple task that I was sure I could do. By the time I had become a first father, I already had three degrees. And so changing a diaper seemed like something I could do until she told me, otherwise. She told me I was doing it wrong. And of course, because she's the mother, she knows. And so of course, I walked away from that experience feeling deflated, depleted, and of course, what most men feel, completely incompetent. But it turns out that there are probably many ways to do it. And it doesn't have to just be that one way. And just like parenting, no. we have to figure out, no, there aren't more than one way. There's only one way. The women in the room are now saying there's only one way. Right? Yeah, don't get me started on loading the dishwasher. Somebody once told me the best thing a man could ever do is when emptying or loading the dishwasher is break a few dishes. Because then you'll never be asked to do it again. Somebody had said that the same thing. My father apparently, I'm sure my mother is now looking at this, but my father used to stick us with the pin when he would diaper us. Not on purpose. <laughs> but of course, he then didn't have to diaper us much more after that. <laughs> the truth is, though, there are many ways to skin a cat, so to speak. And there are many ways to accomplish the exact same task. And so there is an ability that people have and a desire that people have to want to do things their own way. And that it's OK to try different things until you find your own way. When I was first ordained, I didn't really have my own voice in speaking to a congregation. And so I tried different people's approaches. First, I began with Ismar Shorsh, who was the chancellor of the seminary, to imitate his voice. He seemed impactful. Later in my rabbinate, I started to imitate Bill Clinton. I would bite my bottom lip. I would do this with my hand. It turned out that it wasn't until many years later that I found my own voice and my ability to speak my own way. 
And so it resonates with me, this morning's introduction to the parsha, because it says, Vasuli mikdash v'ashachanti betocham, God says, make for me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst you. The exact wordings are, Vayidaber Adonai al Moshe Lemor, God said to Moses, Daber al kol b'nei Yisrael, Vayichuli trumami eit kol ish asher yidbenu libo. God says to Moses, take from every person of the people of Israel a gift. And you should accept those gifts. And those gifts should come from a person's heart. From each person, you take what they're going to give you. And from that, you're going to construct a tabernacle. And then just one verse later, it says, And this is the gift I want you to get. The verse says, get whatever they want to give. Take whatever their heart tells them. And the next verse says, but this is what I want. It's kind of strange. It's like somebody saying to you, I don't need anything for my birthday. Just get me whatever you want. But if you're going to get me something, look at the husbands and wives looking at each other. It happens all the time, right? If you're going to get me something, at least get me something I want. And that's exactly what the Parsha says. Give whatever you want, but this is what you should give me. And it causes an incredible problem for us. Because while the HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what the Almighty wants is to build a tabernacle that God can dwell amongst us. It should be a creative gift. It should be something that comes from the individual. It shouldn't be something that's just like everybody else. It should be your own personalized gift. But if you're going to bring it together to build a tabernacle, the pieces have to go together. And so there has to be specifics. And there have to be parts that fit together like a puzzle. Otherwise, you end up with a potluck dinner with only desserts. And that's a problem. Because that doesn't make a meal. It only makes what people like to eat. And that's dessert. So this morning's parsha says, it's one thing to have a fixed object you're supposed to bring it's another thing to be creative about it the most amazing thing about this morning's parsha is if you were to go through detail by detail exactly what it says in the construction of the tabernacle you'd have a hard time building what we actually built if you look specifically at all of the parts and all of the vessels and you tried from that parsha to construct a tabernacle, you'd be hard-pressed to be able to figure out the parts. It's much harder than the IKEA pictures. It's a foreign language to those people. And sometimes you end up with more parts than you're supposed to have. And you wonder, did they just simply add a few extra bolts just in case you lost one? Or did you forget to do something? And that's the description we have in this week's parsha, And we find ourselves in the age-old conflict. God wants us to speak from our hearts in spontaneous worship of the Almighty, in a spiritual moment that transcends the everyday. But on the other hand, there's got to be a fixed prayer. You got to be able to know what to say when you come to synagogue. You got to come to synagogue on a regular basis. It's like running a marathon. If one day you wake up and you say to yourself, I feel inspired to run, to run 26.2 miles, you won't be able to do it. But if you practice every day, there will be those moments of ecstasy. But if you wait for the moment to move you, it might never happen. And so this morning's parsha says something very simple. Give a gift of your heart, but make sure it's a valuable contribution. Give the gift that your soul tells you to give, but make sure it fits in with the community's needs. And so we have three 
separate commentaries. The Malbin says each one needs to participate in the project of building the tabernacle. It's so true. Everybody needs to participate. If the tabernacle is a precursor to the temple and the temple is a precursor to the synagogue, then we can make the exact same comment today, and that is everybody needs to be participating in this project we call the building of the synagogue. Look, there are three major construction projects that we find in the Bible. The first is that of the Tower of Babel, in which God destroys the temp this great tower because the purpose was something that wasn't in line with our values. Another great building project was building of Noah's Ark, a solitary project that he did on his own in order to save life. And finally now, the tabernacle. And this is the first time the community is asked to come together to build a project so that God can live amongst us, not so that we strive to live in God's place, not so that we can save life on our own, but to come together as a project of community. The Abravanel says, God doesn't need a tabernacle. We need a tabernacle. We don't build a tabernacle so God can live amongst us. We build a tabernacle, says the Abravanel, so we can come together. It's a community building project. I say it all the time with regards to the projects we do here in this building. We don't do them for the purpose of ritual. We don't do them because we're obligated to. We do them as a means to bring each other together. If I give a class in which nobody's interested and nobody shows, then what's the point? Even if it's very interesting to me, it has to bring people together. Rosenzweig says that building the tabernacle is an imitation of God's building of the world. It's an imitation of creation. We have to do the same for our community. And that is bring each and one of our own individual agenda, ideas, creativities, abilities in order to build this place even more. We find ourselves now at an incredible moment in the station of our congregation. Thank God we are a community that is growing. And because of that, the building is expanding its footprint. Not literally, but figuratively. We currently have our religious school meeting in almost every corner of the building because we have expanded that size. Our sanctuary walls, as you can see, are opening further, not just for security reasons, but because we want to be able to fit more people in here. Our programming is growing because of the needs of the community and because of the creative contribution that people are making. We're growing in ritual, we're growing in programs, we're growing in social action. This is a synagogue that's on the rise. But it's on the rise because we come together in this community project called synagogue building. Look, synagogue's been around for thousands of years. And I know there have been people out there who recently are saying that the synagogue is dying. As an institution, shuls are disappearing because there are these pop-up minyanim. There are these pop-up programs. But I'm here to tell you one simple thing. The synagogue is alive and well and living here in the River Downs. Our synagogue is doing well. And we look forward to the next stages of our development. But that will only happen when each and every person in our community says, this is what I have to offer. This is what I bring to the table. This is what I want to give. This is my gift that will help in the continued construction and growth of our community. And some of those gifts will be in the form of finances. But some of those gifts will be in the form of coming together to make Kiddush on a Shabbos morning. 
Some of that will come together in order to reach out to members in our community who don't feel well. And sometimes those will come in the form of cards and sometimes they'll come in the form of visits and sometimes they'll come in the form of phone calls. This is a community that's on the rise because everybody in this community says, I have something to give and it fits in to what we need in order to grow, to live, to prosper, but more, to thrive. This morning's parsha says, we started the process of building a tabernacle. It transformed into a temple and now morphed into a synagogue that's here to stay. This morning's parsha says, make me a sanctuary so that I might dwell amongst you, says God. And we have done just that. But it will require every individual to continue to make their contribution in order to understand what God wants. There's an amazing statement in Sifre Devarim, in a wonderful midrash on the book of Devarim, that says, if you want to understand God, you need to look at the people around you because everybody is made in the image of God. I try to understand that piece of Sifre Deuteronomy a little bit differently. If you want to understand God, says the Midrash, look around you. And I say at that moment, God isn't saying look around you so that you can see my image in the world, so that God can dwell amongst us. But look around you because don't be worried with trying to figure out who God is. See, Fred Deuteronomy says, figure out who we are. Don't be so obsessed with what's the nature of God. Is God transcendent or imminent? Don't be obsessed with God's compassion or omnipotence or omniscience. Be concerned with each other. Learn who you are. Yeah, that'll reflect the Almighty. But more important, figure out who's sitting next to you and figure out what their unique contribution is. You'll never understand the Almighty, but at least you can understand each other. This morning's parsha says, figure out each other, figure out yourself. You have a unique gift to make. You have a unique contribution to give. And that's the way to build shul. That's the way to build community. And that's the essence of the survival of the Jewish people. Shabbat shalom.